Okay, so welcome everybody to the SNAP seminar today. We're very happy to have Lena Wang from Carnegie Mellon University today. She's going to be giving a talk about sharp waiting time balance for multi server jobs. Lena was one of the original organizers of SNAP, so she has everything under control even more than we do. We're very happy to have you. Um, so Wayna uh, is an assistant professor in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, her research lies in the broad area of applied probability and stochastic systems with applications in resource orchestration in large computing systems, data centers, and privacy preserving data analytics. She was a joint postdoctoral research associate at the Coordinated Sci uh, Science Lab at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the School of ECE at Arizona State University from 2016 to 2018. She got her PhD degree in electrical engineering from Arizona State University in 2016, and her BS from the Department of Electronic Engineering at Tsinghua University in 2009. We are very happy to have you here. Please uh, take over. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Mariana. So um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here to come to a SNAP seminar as a speaker after co-organizing it for a year last year. So it's, it's a great honor to speak to this crowd. Um, so uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, um, uh, multi-server jobs scheduling. So uh, this is a, this talk is based on joint work uh, with my PhD student Yi and uh, um, uh, and another paper which is a joint work with Xiaoming, uh, who just moved to. Okay, let me uh, get this. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, it's based on two papers and uh, most of the results I'm going to present are coming from the first paper with Igor, and the second paper is joint work with Xiaoming who just uh, uh, moved to University of Wisconsin Medicine and uh, uh, my colleague Moore Hakobot at CMU. So Xiaoming and Igor are also in the audience and they will, uh, if you have quick questions, you can add, like they will monitor the chat box and answer those, okay? Um, okay, so since the topic of my talk today is on multi-server jobs, let me start by explaining what is a multi-server job. So traditionally, um, with most, in most job models, um, a job is a single server job. So that means when this job comes to the system, it's going to be served on one server, on a single server, okay? Uh, well, on the other hand, a multi-server job uh, needs to run on multiple servers. So for uh, in this picture, this job here, we use four circles to represent it. That means it needs to, uh, it requires four servers. So we can only serve this job when we have four available servers. And this job is going to hold on to those four servers at the same time uh, during its whole service time, okay? So we say a server need is four. So this is like a family of four uh, come to a restaurant and uh, um, we can only seat them if we have four seats available and they are going to hold on to their seats until they finish their meal and then they will leave the restaurant together, okay? So this is a little bit different from uh, another job model called the um, batch model where each job has consists of multiple parallel tasks so there, the tasks do not need to enter service at the same time, and they may not leave the system at the same time. Okay, so, um, so this is the multi-server job. Why do we care about multi-server? Uh, why do we care about multi-server jobs? Uh, so multi-server jobs actually make a better model for today's, computing, uh, today's cloud computing systems. Uh, so in today's cl clusters, the workloads are run as containers. So each container uh, encapsulates the necessary components to run an application. So it provides the necessary isolation and the consistency for applications. And each container requires a certain, like a container is like this here. So each container requires a certain, res a certain amount of resources to run. And it's better modeled as a multi-server job to capture this uh, simultaneous possession of resources, okay? So con containerization has been uh, adopted by uh, major cloud systems providers, uh, including Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, and uh, uh, Microsoft Azure. So the, the containers here, like the resource allocation for con containers is all managed by an engine called a Kubernetes, and it's, it's an open source version of the Google Borg system. 
So, uh, so Google Borg system has published uh, very comprehensive data traces, and uh, one of them demonstrates this server ne the, the server needs in their large scale uh, clusters. So this picture is taken from a paper uh, by Isaac Grossoff, Moore and Allen. Uh, so this, this picture is generated from the data trace. Uh, it, the X axis here is the uh, number of normalized CPUs requested by a job. This is what we refer to as the server need. And the Y axis is the uh, corresponding fraction of such jobs. So then from this figure, you can see that the server needs has a very wide range. It can be quite large and it can be quite heterogeneous among different jobs, okay? So uh, motivated by this emerging trend in cloud computing, uh, we uh, study this model. So here we have a system with N servers um, and uh, all the jobs come into the system and they enter a central, a central queue. So the, again, the number of circles here represents the uh, server need of the job. So we classify the jobs into several classes uh, based on their um, server needs and uh, other parameters. For, for each class I job, the arrival process is Poisson with rate lambda I, and we denote the server need by L sub I. Okay, so in this case is five for the red one. And then like when it enters service, it, it, the service time is exponential, uh, follows the exponential distribution with rate mu sub i, okay? And uh, at any, uh, so yeah, so this is a summary of all the parameters for the class. And at any moment of time, a scheduling policy determines which jobs to put into service. And so um, in this, so for example, this scheduling policy can be first come first serve in that case, we uh, serve the jobs from the queue in their arrival order, okay? So there are several phenomena that are, that, that are interesting here that couldn't happen for single server jobs. So for example, in this picture here, we have those two servers idle now, although we have jobs in the queue, but the, next, but the job here, this green job, it needs four servers to run, so it's blocked, it cannot run by now. And uh, if we run first come first serve, it's also blocking all the jobs in the queue. Um, but this, this waste of server is not unique to first come first, uh, first serve. For example, if we don't have all the three other jobs in the queue, we only have the green one, then still like we couldn't fit this green job into the servers. And uh, so we have idle servers and the jobs waiting in the queue at the same time, okay? So there's another interesting phenomenon here uh, so let's still take first come first serve as an example. Uh, so in if when we look at this red job, if the red job leaves, that will free up five servers. So together we have seven servers. Then like that, the next three jobs can enter service at the same time. However, if uh, this it is this blue job that's going to depart, then we only have three servers available. Then still like we couldn't fit the green job. So this this kind of uh, um, jitter effect is, cannot, like, cannot happen in single server jobs and that makes the queuing dynamics quite complicated, okay? So let's think about the notion of load for multi-server jobs. Uh, so tradition, so the load here is denoted by rho and it's the sum of the loads from different classes. And for single server jobs, that would be the arrival rate uh, di divided by the service rate and normalize the back end because this is kind of the arrival rate of the time requirement of jobs. However, for multi-server jobs, we need to reflect its resource usage. We need to uh, multiply this by, this by the server need because then like this together, the server need times one over mu i, which is the time need, then this reflects the CPU hours needed by multi-server jobs, okay? So, um, so this is our new definition of load. This is each row i. And when, uh, when we look at the system, the, the n times row i here also uh, represents the uh, mean, the, the uh, expectation of the number of servers basically uh, working on each class in steady state. So n row i would be for class one, and then we have n row two and so on, okay? And then like the rest of the servers or like the uh, expected number of idle servers in, in steady state. 
um, is, uh, is de uh, denoted by delta, which is just uh, what is left from, uh, from all those busy servers. So it's n times one minus rho, and we call this our slack capacity, okay? So we are going to talk about the load, sometimes in terms of rho, sometimes in terms of delta, which are equivalent ways of measuring the load. Okay, okay. So uh, with this model, we want to ask the following questions. So basically our goal is to understand the job latency. And in particular, we are very interested in the time jobs spend waiting in the queue uh, rather than in, this, in service because the service part is kind of fixed. So we want to uh, answer the following questions. So first, what is the queuing probability under various uh, scheduling policies? So the queuing probability is the probability for a arriving job to have to queue rather than directly entering service, okay? And we uh, uh, even more uh, relevant metric is the queuing time. So this is the time a job spends waiting in the queue. Uh, this actually includes, um, so first the, it includes the initial waiting period before the job enters service uh, for the first time, but uh, it also uh, includes the time where a job is preempted, so it, it goes back to the queue and needs to spend some time in the queue. So it's the total queuing time uh, or like a waiting time, we use those two words interchangeably. So it's the total queuing time when the job is in the system, okay? And then from a design perspective, we want to ask which scheduling policy minimizes the queuing time, okay? Okay, so uh, those are our goal. And uh, uh, this problem is, is not a total, completely new. It, it has been studied before. So I'm going to talk about the related work a little bit, and then like I'll stop a little, uh, little bit uh, to see if people have questions, okay? So it has been uh, studied like actually very early on, but only for very small scale systems. And uh, the exact solutions are only known in those very uh, special cases. And the policy wise, the people have, have been focusing on first come first serve, but even understanding like uh, totally characterizing the stability region of first come first serve is not an easy question. So it's only known under some, again, under some special cases. There's a recent paper by Asak um, uh, Grosov, which studies uh, two class systems and there have been work on uh, the case where all the jobs have uh, uh, the same service rate, okay? And then, uh, the, like finally, there have been some like uh, there's you know very recent work again by Isaac Grosov and et al. So like uh, where we have some analytical bounds uh, on the uh, on the response time in a very interesting setting where the server needs actually divide the num total number of servers in the system. Okay. And there has been, uh, those are uh, the uh, work that, uh, related work that actually focuses on multi-server job models, but there have been also other, other work that study related models. So for example, if we remove the queue that will become the dropping model and there um, like uh, for, uh, for, for some policies, we actually know the stationary distribution, but uh, also there's a question of optimal dropping policy, okay? And then like, we can also think of this problem as a virtual machine scheduling problem, which has been studied before, um, but most of the uh, results have focused on stability and the limited results is available for uh, latency. And also like, uh, as I mentioned before, this is uh, different, but related to the uh, multi, uh, multi-task job model or batch job model. Okay, so uh, I think this is a good place to, for questions because I just defined the model. Um, do people have any clarification questions? I have just a, a, a quick one that's further back. Um, as a non-computer scientist, you talked about the containerization. Mm -hmm. Does each container need one server or each container needs a subset of servers? Oh yeah, so uh, it, needs, uh, it specifies how many CPUs it needs. And then like here, we model the CPUs as servers. Okay, so each container is a job. Yeah, each container is a job. Yeah, yeah, thank you for asking this question. <laughs> okay, okay, so yeah, so let me continue. So, um, okay, so it seems like this, uh, so 
like in summary, uh, analyzing multi-server jobs has been a hard problem. So how can we make progress here? What kind of new perspectives can we bring? So a defining feature of today's computing clusters is its scale, okay? So in today's computing clusters, the number of servers n is very large. And then like, so for this audience, I probably don't need to spend too much time motivating this uh, asymptote, uh, this scaling regime where n goes to infinity, but just to make sure we are all on the same page. If we study the behavior of the system as n goes to infinity, that will allow us to approximate a very large system. So we can have, so we can approximate the performance in a large scale system, okay? So then like, can we study those questions in scaling regimes where n goes to infinity? So in fact, for some special settings, we do, have, we do understand uh, the uh, prob uh, uh, queuing probability and the time from classical results. So for example here, this, if we only have one job type and uh, each job needs four servers, then we are basically running an MM and over two uh, queuing system. And for this system, uh, we have a lot of, we understand it uh, like in many aspects. So let's divide the traffic regimes based on the slack capacity. Uh, so the larger the slack capacity is, uh, the lighter the traffic is. So here, this is the heavier end, this is the lighter end, okay? So for all those different regimes, uh, we actually understand the queuing probability. And this, this, this regime here is the, is the uh, famous hopping weight regime. Uh, if the traffic is lighter than that, then the queuing probability diminishes. If the uh, queuing, then like uh, for the heavier traffic case, the queuing probability goes to one, okay? And for the expected queuing time, uh, uh, if this is a theta one, then this, this is the non-degenerative slowdown uh, regime. And in that case, so, uh, so if the traffic is lighter than this, the queuing time diminishes and the, uh, beyond that, the queuing time doesn't diminish, okay? So we do understand the queuing probability and queuing time in this case. However, those results fall short if we have very large server needs. So in, let's think about the, uh, so, okay. So here, like uh, I want to, I want to like emphasize a little bit that this regime over here, like those three regime together, um, this is a very appealing regime for today's uh, uh, computing clusters because here we have very high utilization the slack capacity actually has a diminishing fraction of uh, compared to uh, the total number of servers. So the utilization is actually very high, but the queuing time is very short uh, as reflected by the diminishing queuing time here, okay? So now let's think, uh, uh, let's think about the case where the server needs are actually also large. And in this, for example, let's think about this very extreme example where the server need is half of the servers, okay? And then in this case, do we still have all of those results? Okay. So if we think about it, this is actually just the equivalent to an MM2 system with the same load as the original system. And the load actually, like, actually goes to one. So then like, we know that those results no longer hold because even in this case, the queuing probability doesn't diminish anymore, okay? And then more generally, the server needs are not just large, but they are also heterogeneous. Uh, they can be very different in their scale. And uh, remember that, recall that our the definition of load is like this. And this is, so now I put this superscript in here to indicate the, prime, uh, the parameters could depend on n. So this server need here could depend on n. As n becomes larger, this could become large. And we are also going to scale the arrival rate uh, so we can get uh, like the scaling of the load. Uh, so here we are fixing the uh, service rates and the number of job classes K here, okay? So, we, so the scaling, uh, scaling parameters are the arrival rates and the server needs. And they together give us the scaling of the load, okay? So as we just saw the load, if we only know how the load scales within, that's not enough to characterize the latency. And so then this, so this, this means we need new scaling regimes, okay? We need to jointly uh, scale the load and also the server need. We need to consider those two things all together, okay? So recall that those are the questions we wanted to answer 
So now our perspective is, uh, can we answer those questions under this new joint scaling regime? Okay. So in particular, uh, again, like uh, we are, we need to think about uh, like uh, those two things together. Here, the load scales within, and the server needs also scale within, and we want to answer the queuing time questions on this 2D plane. Okay. So to make the scaling regime more concrete, uh, let's first look at uh, look at the load. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned before, the load can also be described by the slack capacity. And here I'm assuming the slack capacity is n to the alpha where alpha is between zero and one, okay? And then the x-axis is represented by alpha. So the larger alpha is, the lighter the traffic is. And for the y-axis, let's assume the maximum server need is in the form of n to the gamma. And this gamma is also between zero and one. So the maximum server need is the largest server need among all the job types, okay? So now we have this 2D plane here. Uh, so, uh, so this is, uh, by the way, this is just a special case of uh, our results in the paper. So in the paper, we don't need the server need and the stack capacity to be in the, those specific forms they can be more general. But here I'm plotting those in those terms uh, for, e, for ease of uh, exposition, okay? Okay, so now we have this 2D plane. And uh, uh, if we look at this part, this is the part where gamma is larger than or equal to alpha. That means the slack capacity is not enough to accommodate even one job with the maximum server need. So this part, has, the traffic is very heavy and we actually didn't consider this part in our work, okay? So we are going to focus on this lower right triangle here. And for this part, we also divide it into two regions. This blue region here, this is the lighter one among those two. And for this region, we actually have the following results. So um, under certain work conserving policy that I'm going to describe a, a little bit more. So uh, that like under work conserving policies, we show that the queuing probability in this blue region uh, goes to zero as n goes to one. So what is work conserving policy here? As we just saw, like the system is not truly work conserving, right? We can have idle servers and the jobs in the queue at the same time. So the work conserving here is just almost the work conserving, meaning that uh, we don't let more than LMAX servers idle if we have jobs in the queue. Okay, so it's reasonably work conserving. So for all, all those policies, the queuing, the queuing probability goes to zero. Okay, and in our later work, we can actually also uh, uh, characterize the expected queuing time there. And the queuing time also goes to zero very quickly. It goes to zero even faster than any poly, uh, than polynomial, okay? So, so this blue region is uh, like the traffic, although it's still in heavy traffic regime, but it's relatively light where the queuing time is like a very small for all the reasonably work conserving policies. So they all perform very well here, okay? So this motivates us to focus on the right part of, uh, of the regimes. And this is the, what I'm going to uh, focus on for the rest of my talk, okay? So for this, uh, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, do people have questions on the uh, scaling regimes here? I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the blue regime, um, uh, so you just state this, uh, you show that the probability goes to zero and the expectation goes to zero. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, if you go into the specifics of the rates of convergence and so on, is there any qualitative difference between this setting and a simple like single job setting? By single job, you mean just a single job type, right? Uh, uh, I mean, each job needs only one server. Single, not the multi-server setting. Yes, yes, it, the, it, the, 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 the rate would depend on the maximum server need. I see, okay, okay, okay. So I- Hold on a question then. Uh, in the, the very heavy part you're not considering, do you say the queue is actually stable or, or, is a, or, or not? Oh uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So actually uh, here, like when we assume our max, uh, uh, so basically when we are in this blue setting, those policies are stable. But as we move away from there, like uh, stability sometimes, like especially in this very heavy region, sometimes the, for, for example, for the comfort server may not be stable anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I had a quick question as well. Uh, so you you drew this uh, this dotted line between the half comma zero and the the top right. So is that the so so in the special case where all the server needs are equal to L max, is that mm -hmm. the is that line corresponding to the half and width uh, regime? Yeah, yeah. I should mention that. So uh, suppose we so suppose we only have one uh, job type. Then this line here, this corresponds to the having weight regime, and uh, this line is uh, anal analogous to the NDS regime. Okay, and uh, uh, so we, uh, if we only have one job type, we also know that beyond this this line over here, like all the regions here, their queuing probability doesn't go to zero. So that's consistent with the, the results for like uh, super halving weight regimes and uh, sub halving weight regimes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Can I so, ask one more follow up question? Sure. So you said that the rates depend on uh, L max. So mm -hmm. is the behavior of this system for a given alpha and gamma in the blue regime similar to the behavior of? Uh, uh, the classical system with each job needing one uh, one server uh, corresponding to alpha minus gamma. Uh, uh, so uh, this, yeah, it, it, it is similar in the sense that like yeah. So if we so for example like uh, if we just think of one job type with the maximum server need, yeah, then the like uh, it's like what you're thinking, right? That's when the. Uh, uh, when the slack velocity is into the alpha divided by uh, minus gamma, right? Okay. Is that, yeah, so that is the, the analogy there. Okay, 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 got mm. it, thanks. thanks. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so let's move on to this right region here, okay? And uh, uh, we, want to, we want to answer the following questions. So we want to study the expected queuing time. So first the question is, does the queuing time still diminish in this right region? And uh, probably yes, like under like good policies, right? Because this is as as uh, Yash just uh, uh, asked, like this line here is uh, analogous to the NDS regime. So hopefully beyond uh, below that, like we have diminishing expected queuing time. Okay, but then like if it diminishes, then how fast does it diminish? Okay, so this is a question that I wanted to highlight it. So there has been a, a lot of work on diminishing queuing time, especially in load balancing systems. And uh, the focus has been on uh, identifying the policies which have diminishing queuing time. However, we actually, like um, for many times, like in many scenarios, we don't know how fast it converges to zero. And uh, only knowing that the, the queuing time is diminishing is not enough because like for many policies with diminishing queuing time, you can actually see very different performance in like in reality, okay? So this, this question then is more, is very important here. So we want to differentiate policies between policies with diminishing queuing time by looking at their, uh, their diminishing speed, okay? Okay. So this is the, the second question we want to answer. And uh, then like natu naturally we want to know which policy has um, a queuing time that has the optimal order, okay? So our answers to those questions are um, is threefold. So first that we study the commonly used first come first serve policy, we characterize it as queuing time. And then we derived a lower bound on the expected queuing time. And then like uh, we, uh, show a policy that has uh, the optimal order for queuing time, okay? So uh, this is the overview of the results I'm going to present. So let me start with the first come first serve, okay? So for first come first serve, um, so we can show that uh, the expected queuing time is exactly this order. This is the big theta, okay? So it's not just the upper bound, but it's also a lower bound. So we know the exact order here. Okay, and recall that uh, this uh, alpha parameter is defined by the slack capacity. The slack capacity is into the alpha and the maximum server need is into the gamma, okay? Okay, so what does this result say? So it says that um, for this red region, we do know that this queuing time like it goes to zero for end of first come first serve because uh, here gamma is smaller than alpha, okay? 
However, this convergence could be very slow, especially like when we are near this diagonal line here, right? Because the, the speed is gamma minus alpha here, okay? So yeah, so um, like it's great in the sense that it has a diminishing queuing time, but the speed could be very slow. So then like we want to ask, so is this the best we can do? Can we actually do better than first come first serve? So that's when we derive this lower bound. So this lower bound says for under any policy in the right, so if we look at the right region, then the expected queuing time has a lower bound like this. So it's, uh, it's the big uh, uh, omega, which means it's, it's larger in order than n to the minus alpha. Again, like n to the alpha is the slack capacity and n to the gamma is the maximum server need. Here, this, as long as we are in the right region, the speed only depends on slack capacity, okay? Okay, so when we compare this, let's compare this with first come first serve, then we can see that the difference is in the factor of n to the gamma, right? So um, they are like quite different. And we were wondering what causes this gap, right? Is it because we have a lower bound that is too loose? Or is this because first come first serve is just not good, is not a good idea, okay? Okay, so uh, this is going to be answered by uh, the next result here. So here we consider a policy that we refer to as the P priority policy that I'm going to define in a minute. But under this policy, the expected queuing time is big O of N to the minus alpha. So it's a, a smaller in order uh, compared to N to the minus alpha. So this is a, the optimal rate we just saw from the lower bound, okay? Okay, so what is the P priority? It's very simple. So this is a priority policy that uh, gives higher priorities to job classes with the smaller server needs. So for example, without a loss of generality, if we just uh, order, the, uh, order the jobs according to their server needs in this way, uh, then we're going to give higher priority to jobs with the job types with the smaller indices, okay? And uh, because we are study, studying the scaling regimes, uh, this is actually equivalent to uh, a priority policy that prioritizes jobs based on uh, the server need divided by uh, the service rate, okay? So they are equivalent in the, in the uh, asymptotically in the scaling regimes. Okay, so then like with this uh, theorem, uh, it means that like we were asking whether the lower bound is tight or not. And here, because it's achievable by P priority. So then we know that the optimal order is indeed N to the minus alpha, okay? And moreover, we know that the P pre, uh, we know that like first come first serve now is just a strictly suboptimal because the order is different, is much larger than this, okay? Okay, so um, yeah, so those are uh, a summary of our results. Questions? Hey, Alan. Hi. Um, if one wanted to consider the special case where um, one only had one class of job, where the job size grew as gamma and I had alpha spare servers, um, First come, first serve is going to look like any service policy, right? Right, right. Yeah. So can you interpret these results just in that specific framework for me? So there, uh, so for those, so in that case, like all the policies are the same. And uh, so there we have some um, assumptions that I haven't had a chance to mention right now, but basically we need some more assumptions. We need a mixture of traffic. Uh, from like those job types. Okay, so the biggest job types can't make up too much of the traffic in some sense. Um, yes, and uh, it can also, uh, it also, it needs to be common enough, but not uh, like, uh, not, not just uh, like uh, all, we, we cannot have all the traffic uh, uh, from, from the uh, biggest jobs. Thank you. Hey, VJ. Hi, Vena. Yeah, so the one, uh, so it seems like what is causing problems for FCFS is this uh, head of line blocking by the big jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is sort of very reminiscent in some sense of earlier analysis from 
this is almost 20 years ago where people looked at uh, heavy traffic, not heavy traffic, sorry. Um, what am I saying? Um, the jobs, the jobs of very large sizes coming into the system. Um, heavy tail, sorry, heavy tail systems. They're heavy, and their FCFS has a very similar uh, type of loss in performance with the head of line blocking. And I don't know if you've compared your results with the um, heavy tail systems. Where there are again certain priority things where you give priority to smaller jobs. Those uh, things perform much better. Okay, so yeah, I, I would Venkert, love to see that. Like uh, I think the Venkert has a, a nice paper from the uh, late late nineties or in the uh, early two thousands. I see, I see. That. Yeah, I can see the similarity, like uh, the uh, comparison there. So here is more like a blocking in terms of uh, the number of servers you occupy. There is the blocking in terms of the time, like you occupy those servers, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to see those like references and uh, uh, like and see exactly how they are related. I think Venkat has some paper in the late nineties. Venkat Antram has something there in the late nineties to early two thousands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Isaac. Thanks for the talk. Um, so I, I was wondering, right now you have two parameters that scale with n, um, the L's and the um, total and the um, Slack capacity. There's two other parameters, the job class probabilities and the um, speed probability, the this, this class speeds. Mm -hmm. um, are there obstacles to those two parameters scaling within as well or? Okay, yeah. So first, uh, for the um, probabilities is so if we go back to the um, yep, yeah, I don't maybe that's too many slides away. Okay, so I'm going to just say in words. So the uh, uh, job probability is like uh, the arrival rate of each type divided by the total arrival rate. So here, right. since we specify the how each lambda i scales, so we didn't like uh, separate it from the job probability. So it's like totally, so we specify how each lambda i scales and okay, that so should, should give you a scaling of the probabilities. So the mixture of jobs can change as n goes to infinity. Yes, yes. But we okay. do make some like uh, technical assumptions there. Okay. In terms of and, the then... and then the service rates, we, we assume mm -hmm. they are constant. And uh, um, it's a good question. Like, uh, uh, I'm not totally sure if they are, they can also be of a different order than how that would change the results. So right now they are kind of all, all constant and I can imagine if they're all of the same order, maybe like things are not too bad. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to, so for the rest, uh, uh, um, uh, for the uh, for I only have several slides left. I'm going to give a very very brief uh, proof sketch of the results we have. Um, so um, our results has those three parts, and uh, the uh, so if we think about uh, so for all those three parts, we want to bound the queuing time. So that would be equivalent to bounding uh, the total number of jobs in the queue. Okay, um, so. So basically we want to bound this expect expectation of the sum of the queues, okay? However, if we want to directly bound it, that will be uh, very difficult because first, uh, if we analyze the drift of the total number of jobs in the queue, then the drift that doesn't have a nice form, like uh, because the, you can imagine the job departure rate would depend on which jobs from each uh, class, how many jobs from each class are in service, okay? So even if you know the total number of jobs or even if you know the total number of servers that are busy right now, you don't know uh, how many jobs from each type are in serv service and you don't know the departure rate, okay? So and directly analyzing the drift of this thing is not easy. And on the other hand, if we want to, um, we want to use uh, methods uh, like it's Stein's method, then we will need to find a Lyapunov function f whose drift is uh, roughly the total Q length. And in this case, it's not easy to find such a, a Lyapunov function either. 
it's hard to construct something with the drift that's just the, the total Q length, okay? Um, however, um, like we, we still want to make use of the drifts. So then like we need to understand the, the queuing dynamics, we need to understand what is the, like uh, the correct uh, fluid system that uh, approximates the system, okay? So the right quantity to look at here is what we call workload. It's not exactly the amount of work, but uh, it's rather, rather it's defined like this. So here, this is the server need divided by service rate. So this is the CPU hours uh, like uh, needed by uh, each job of type I. And we time it by QI. So this quantity here is the total amount of resources needed by all the jobs in the system, okay? So for this workload, if we look at uh, its derivative, then it's roughly like this is the arrival part, this is the departure part, ZI is the number of uh, I type jobs in service. And then like, so the, then like if we look at this quantity here, it's the total number of servers busy and it's roughly N like minus some like uh, uh, wastage there. Uh, but the roughly, we know what this quantity is, is basically the negative of the slack capacity, okay? Plus minus some uh, lower order terms. So, so this is the quantity we actually, like for which we actually understand this drift. So then like uh, based on this, we will, for, to prove our results, we actually first approve some bounds on the workload. Again, the workload is defined like this, okay? So our, a uh, key result that enables us to study the queuing time is this uh, uh, tight bounds on workload. So we have like both the upper and the lower bounds. So this is, uh, uh, this is the big theta here, okay? So we know it's exactly this order. And uh, once we have that, we need to convert uh, the workload bounds to uh, total queue length bounds. So here the workload is a weighted sum of all the queues. So how should we convert this to just the plain uh, sum of the queues. So for first come first serve, um, we actually can show that, like we can sandwich a first come first system between two systems. And for those systems, uh, the queue, the, both the upper bounding system and the lower bounding system, the, 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 the amount of, uh, the number of uh, I type jobs in the queue is, a propor is roughly proportional to its arrival rate, okay? So then like we know the, proportion of each uh, uh, the jobs from each type, then like uh, we can, then if we know that this weighted sum, we are able to convert that to just uh, the plain sum of the queues, okay? So this is the for first come first serve. And then for our lower bound, um, we actually simply just solve a optimization problem. So we have like the optimizing, uh, the optimizing uh, variables here are the queue length. We want to see how the total Q, how small the total Q length could be if we are subject to this workload constraint, okay? Because the workload has to be in this order. And based on this, we can derive the order of the total Q length, okay? And then for the optimal policy, because the policy we consider is this P priority policy, so then like the higher priority jobs cannot see lower priority jobs. Then like different jobs of different priority classes are actually in different traffic regimes. And we separate them and uh, uh, bound, them, like, uh, bound them like separately in different traffic regimes. So basically uh, in, the, in, in the most uh, typical setting, the waiting time, as you can imagine, the waiting time from the uh, type with the largest server need is going to dominate the total uh, waiting time, okay? Okay, so then like, uh, so then the key is to just uh, to uh, prove this, these tight bounds on the workload. And uh, um, there we can make use of the drifts. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to present the details here, but roughly uh, we have a lower bound that's kind of interesting because this is not uh, uh, like uh, deriving lower bounds is like uh, not as common as deriving upper bounds here. So the lower bound is based on our drift analysis and also like a coupling with the infinite server system, which has an infinite number of servers. So it's a lower bound of the original system. And then like uh, the upper bound is also based on drift analysis, but there 
we would need some state-based collapse result to help us tighten the bounds. And we need some, uh, we need like do, we need to do the state-based collapse iteratively, okay? Okay, so those are the uh, uh, proofs, uh, the proof sketch that I would like to present. So to summarize, um, remember that those are the three questions we wanted to answer. So we, uh, for the, uh, so like we look at the uh, scaling regimes where we mostly focus, we focus on the red and the blue regimes. So our answers to those questions in the scaling regimes are like this. So first question, what is the queuing probability? We answer that in the blue regime, we say it's like a diminish, it diminishes for uh, reasonably work conserving policies. And for the expected queuing time, um, we can show that it's faster diminishing in the blue regime and for the red regime and the first of first comments in this order, and uh, uh, for under P priority, it's uh, at this order, which is uh, optimal, okay? And then for this question of optimal order, then we have shown that P priority has the optimal order in, in the red regime, okay? Okay, and going forward, so there are a lot of questions that are still open. So for example, an immediate next question will be for this even heavier traffic regime, like the systems, maybe like in some, um, in some rush hours, the, the traffic could be high, such that it's even heavier than what we are thinking in the, in the right one, okay? So then in this case, we would love to have policies that uh, degrade very gracefully, even in this heavier traffic regimes. Okay, and there the question is more complicated as Fernando pointed out, like there the stability question, uh, we, we need to care more about the stability because they're like, uh, for example, first come first serve may not, be, uh, may not be stable in some, in many cases, okay? Okay, so then like uh, also like uh, we have studied uh, the P priority, which is a uh, uh, preemptive policy, uh, but uh, sometimes the preemption is not uh, um, it's not desired. So then it may be it might be better to have a non preemptive policy. And uh, in our simulations, we can actually see that uh, prior the pre priority policy we consider whether it's preemptive or non preemptive, they actually perform similarly. But we don't quite have a good analysis of the uh, non preemptive version. Okay, and then. Um, so here we only consider like the CPU uh, needs as the server needs, uh, but you can imagine like the containers, they actually also specify other resource requirements like the memory and the other things. So what if like we consider all the like different types of resources together? And also there's a big question of container utilization in cloud systems. So the, the container is more like the amount of resource a application reserved, but the application may not be using all those resources at all times. And it's a big question or a big, big management hurdle in uh, the systems to like handle the scaling of containers. Like they have those vertical and the horizontal scalings of containers to kind of improve the resource utilization in the system, okay? Yeah, so basically there are like a lot of open questions to ask in this domain. And uh, uh, we just uh, took the first steps towards understanding job latency with the multi-server jobs, okay? Okay, so with this, I'm going to stop here and uh, um, like uh, open the floor for more questions. Let's all thank uh, Vina. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions. Um, I had a further question. Mm -hmm. um, what I was wondering was, so the main obstacle in the gray region above the, re the red region you studied was, mm -hmm. that, um, was that it might not be stable in that region. Suppose one yeah, knew- that's one question. Suppose one knew for other, like from some unrelated analysis that some policy was stable in that region. Um, mm -hmm. Would your results say anything about such a policy, or would we not know? Like, would your bounds apply? Um, questions like that. So right now, it like the bounds do not directly apply. Like in the okay. proofs, we need uh, the we need uh, this delta to be small o 
of uh, sorry, we need the maximum server need to be small O of delta, so we can ignore some of the terms. Uh, but for example, like for the P priority policy, we can extend it to this regime, but we don't know how it's going to perform there. Okay. Um, thanks. I, I think our the paper of mine, Morris and Allen's that you cited can mm -hmm. show that some policies are stable in that regime. Mm -hmm. so that might be an interesting place to explore in the future. Yeah, so we do know some uh, stable policies. Like for example, if you think of the max weight policy, it should be maximally stable. So it should be stable there. Um, yeah, but that, it would be very interesting to look at those stable policies and see how their uh, like response time looks like. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned uh, that there is a state space collapse and you have to prove it iteratively. Can you tell me, can, can you tell more about uh, what the collapse is, what the representation is, what the lower dimensional space is, and, and how you go about proving it? Yeah, so, okay, so for the uh, state space collapse, okay, uh, yeah, perhaps I don't need that slide here. Okay, um, yeah, so um, there are several things. Um, so first, uh, uh, we need to show like this is this is like uh, this is a very uh, it, it's not a very very strong result, but you need to show that the Q length needs to be like uh, bounded in some region, like it cannot be too large, okay. And then like uh, in some and also like uh, there's a there's a part where we actually need uh, uh, sorry let me let me try to remember there. Um, so for the workload, uh, so there's a part where we need to show that, uh, yeah, you could correct me if I'm remembering correctly. So this, uh, there's a part where we need to show that, uh, like uh, the workload, like it, it is a weighted sum in, with those weights, but sometimes we will need to understand the, the total number of servers that are busy, which, which will be more like a, a weight with the, just the L, like without the, the mu's. And uh, uh, so those two weighted sum, like they can be like, you can imagine they can be different, but if the queues are not that large, then like they cannot be too different. Like if the queues are small, then even if you put different weights, then like they are, they are like similar in order. So that is, that is one of the things we need. I see. So the upper bound is for the priority policy, right? Uh, no, this workload, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention this workload that works for any reason, for any work conserving policies. Oh, I see. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Yeah. So it's not the state space collapse that we usually have in heavy traffic where it collapses to a lower dimensional space or something like that. I mean, what I was thinking was you have all these types of queues and then mm -hmm. you give priority to some of them. So there are some results where in such a setting that most of the queues will become zero and there are only a few queues that are not zero, possibly only one. So yeah, that's, that's still true, like under priority policy, we do show that like uh, basically for those higher priority uh, classes, their, heavy, their traffic regimes are much lighter. So okay. their queue lengths are negligible compared to, for example, the last uh, job type, like the one with the largest server need. So that you can think of that as uh, state space claps. Um, but but here, like for the workload, it's it, it's not assuming any specific policy, so it's not like a, you can. It, yeah, I think it's not a, like a, exactly correct to call it a state space collapse, but it's, it has the sense that it has a higher pro, 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 uh, probability of concentrating around the certain areas than other areas. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay, got it. Got it. Thanks. Oh, for the state space collapse, uh, I think. We can think of it in this way. So if we consider the type five jobs that are in the system, including those in the queue and in service, then it should concentrate around the uh, lambda i over mu i. I see. So. Okay, 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 okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Rina? If there are no other questions, let's uh, thank Vina again.
Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. We'll stop the recording and live streaming. So feel free to hang out and chat more.